things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Young. And Pastor, we turn it over to you now. Thank you. All right, all right. Amen, amen. Appreciate everybody for being on. Let me get my screen share in order. Uh, definitely a um, blessing to be on. Uh, yet again, I know I missed last week. I was traveling back, and let me just say I appreciate everybody's prayers. Um, nothing like having a church family pray for you um, and pray for your family. Um, you know, it's, I mean, we've heard this time and time again, you know, we take life for granted. We take family for granted. You know, we take every single second uh, of the day often for granted. But, um, you know, you never truly know um, from one second to the next. So it's just a blessing uh, to trust God. It's a blessing for life, blessing for answered prayer. Uh, that my dad, who you guys have been praying for and we've all been praying for, uh, continues to heal um, and continues to be restored. Um, so just thank you for that. Thank you. I know that Mark's not on, I don't believe, but uh, he held down the fort last week and shared uh, the prayer meeting message on faith. Very good message. I went back and listened to the recording last week and a very, very great message on faith. Um, yes, Elder Debbie, we are. Uh, uh, you know, in, in those think tanks, stretching our brains a bit, but <laughs> it's all for the good, definitely all for the good. So thank you for that testimony as well. And for every person being on and for each testimony, prayer request uh, being sent, I don't know about you, but my day has been good. My day has been busy um, with the number of meetings, preparation, preparing for evangelism, getting more and more details on the summer evangelism, uh, but overall just a great day and it's good to be on this prayer meeting line with everybody tonight. All right, without further ado, let me have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our message for tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you be with us these next few moments. Uh, enlighten us, open up our minds and our understanding. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. We are looking at the church of Thyatira, um, however you may pronounce pronounce it, I pronounce it Thyatira, uh, but me, I'm known to butcher some of these biblical names. Uh, maybe my sounding out isn't the best, but hey, it is what it is. I think you get the gist of what church we're talking about tonight. Um, and so this church is found in the book of Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29, Revelation 2, 18 to 29. Um, for those who can see it on the screen, you'll see the whole PowerPoint. I think it's 19 slides. For those who can't, don't worry. I share everything that's on the slides so that you don't miss anything. Um, again, anybody that wants the slides, I will email them to you. Um, if you want me to wait until I do a review at the end of, um, for instance, instead of doing it at the end of this chap chapter two, um, I'm choosing to do it at the end of the seven churches. But at the end of chapter one, we did a review. Of chapter two did not break the flow of it. Um, we'll do the review at the end of chapter three. But if you want the slides broken up or if you want it all together, feel free to let me know. Um, I don't mind. I think you'll get more out of it if you get it all at one time and just have it in one PowerPoint. But hey, that's my um, that's how my mind works. Your mind may work a little bit different. All right, here we go. Revelation chapter two, verses 18 to 20 to start because the verse was because this um, section was so long. I broke this up into a couple of different um, slides. Revelation 2, 18 and 22, it says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. And then the last few verses, verse 23 to 29, it says, I will kill her children with death. All the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, 
to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, in, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and should be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel. I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, that was a tremendous mouthful um, from Revelation 2, um, verses 18 all the way to 29. That is a big mouthful, and there's a lot there. You know, and I, I do understand that oftentimes we read uh, uh, things in the Bible, and if we don't understand a phrase, a word, you know, we tend to just move on past it, and um, um, you know, just like okay, well, I don't understand it, and we go on. However, it's imperative that we do try our best to utilize the tools, prayer, um, and different things like that to understand what God is saying. Again, a lot comes from the Old Testament. We're familiar with the name Jezebel. Um, from the Old Testament, right? And so you see that there's a lot of comparisons, um, but you would have to go back to that story to kind of understand who Jezebel was, how how she acted, um, and different things like that to gain a better understanding of what Christ is trying to say to the church of Thyatira when he mentions that phrase and then talks about, I will kill her, with, kill her children with death, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to cover... Um, a few phrases from um, those verses, but first we're going to look at the historical backdrop of Thyatira. If you know me um, and you've seen, I am very, very big on historical background. Um, without the context, we miss a lot of what is actually be, actually trying to be said about anything. Context is imperative. But the historical backdrop of Thyatira is this. It was the smallest and least important of the seven cities referencing where the seven churches are. It had no special or political significance. Citizens of the city were mainly poor laborers as opposed to those in Pergamum. Uh, we already know that church. The Christians in Thyatira evidently did not face the danger of blended pagan religions or pagan lifestyle. Remember, that's what several of the other churches were battling with, battling with in their cities. Neither were they under the of oppression of emperor worship were menaced by Jewish opponents. The threat to this church did not come from outside, but from within. They were dealing with internal issues more than external issues, right? Thyatira was known for many trade guilds. And don't worry, we'll get into what that is. It might be that the danger which threatened the church in this city came directly from those trade guilds. A merchant or trader could not have a job and make money unless he was a member of his trade guild. You can kind of think of it in the sense of a union, per se. This created a real problem for Christians in Thyatira. Remember, let me go back in the slide. A merchant or a trader, which was many people's jobs, did not have a job and make money unless this person was a member of a trade guild. That's important to know. Why? Because this created a real problem for the Christians in Thyatira, for they could not join a trade guild. So if they can't join a trade guild, how do they make money? Remember, poverty is big there. Guild members were expected to attend the guild festivals in the pagan temples and to share a common meal, which would largely, largely consist of meat offered to the guild patron god. The festival often ended with drunkenness and immoral activities, those who refused to participate in the meals would suffer ridicule and the hardships of social isolation and economic sanctions. So you can imagine the Christians were uh, the Christians in this church um, who would not yield. They were facing as this, <coughs> excuse me, as this just stated, ridicule, hardships, social isolation, economic sanctions. They couldn't, <coughs> excuse me, they couldn't, um, they couldn't uh, gain any money because they didn't have any job or anything along those lines because they refused to partake in these trade guilds because these trade guilds, um, they would offer uh, food to the patron god um, or they would 
um, have to be involved in these pet festivals, with immoral activities, sexual activities, drunkenness, all this type of revelry, right? And so they had to stand on truth, um, but that truth would often lead them to financial poverty and a lot of hardship. I have to, I have to scratch my head and wonder if, could we endure that? Could we endure something like that where if we lived in a society right now, let's just take the Detroit metro area, where it said you have to be a part of this particular group in order to have employment. And if you don't have employment, then, uh, or if you're not part of this group, then you have no way to make money. But to be a part of this group, you need to do X, of X and X, Y, Z thing that would be against the Bible. What would we do, right? These individuals, they face that. They face not having any food. We go to our refrigerators, refrigerators stacked with food, right? We don't do well facing ridicule. We don't do well facing hardships when we have literally nothing and, and nothing is coming the next day or the day after, social isolation, economic, economic sanctions. This is what this church was going through in that particular city of Thyatira. Now, several facts uh, pertaining to this church. The message to the church of Thyatira is the longest of the seven. And you saw how I had to take those verses and I had to break it into two slides because of how long this um, section is. It's the longest message, message Sorry, of all seven churches. Jesus comes as the son of God, the one who whose eyes are as a flame of fire and his feet like burnished bronze. Every one of these churches have a different different um, designation of Jesus, right? And when we get to the end of all these seven churches and after the review and all, we're going to go a little bit further because I'm going to give you the historical um, timeline of these churches as well. So we're going to step out of what was happening when John wrote these letters to the church where, and then go into the time periods down the line, the prophetic time period of each of these churches, right? Um, in addition, we're going to look at um, we're going to look at some key things of how these different churches uh, or how Jesus is represented to these different churches and how Jesus works with all of us differently, right? Because we see that in all these churches. So we're going to cover a lot of things with these churches before we move on to uh, Revelation chapter four. But um, also some other facts, the flaming eyes, they symbolize this. They symbolize Christ's penetrating ability to see the innermost part of a human being. Christ can see deeper within any of us than any of us can see within ourselves, right? And so that's why he's the one whose eyes are flaming fire. He sees right through you. He sees through your lie. He sees through your um, half truth. He sees through any and everything. The feet like burnished bronze, they signify his uncompromising stability, right? Remember, this church is going to deal with some things with um, compromise within the church. And so if He's coming as one who I, I have uncompromising stability. He comes to these churches specific to what that church's issue was, right? Also, another fact about this church of God or about, yeah, about this um, church is the church is evidently under intense and careful scrutiny by the penetrating discernment of the one who searches the kidneys and the hearts. It's under intense scrutiny by Jesus, who's looking at every single thing within that church. Now, we have an appraisal um, from Jesus as we see the appraisals throughout these churches. Um, Thyatira, it's an improving church, um, for her last works are greater than the former. In the eyes of Christ, however, get this, an active church does not always mean a faithful church. You can be busy doing a whole bunch of stuff and don't even have Jesus. You may remember the story where um, Jesus and his parents, they went to the temple and when they left, you know, Jesus was, uh, in the temple. I mean, they went to Jerusalem and Jesus was in the temple teaching and they had left Jerusalem and they had went three days into the journey. And that's when they realized, oh, snap, where is Jesus? We ain't got, how often do we continue on in our journeys of life or continue on in our religiosity and forget where we place Jesus at, right? Or, or we've we've forgotten him, but we've moved, we've kept going because we're caught up in activities. We're caught up in um, so many different things. Yes, it's church related, but an active church does not always mean a faithful church. You want to be active and faithful, 
right? So the threat has come rather from inside the church, from those who claim to have authority from God, but have led the church astray, the most dangerous doctrines for the Christian church, which is a doctrine of compromise. Again, I believe I mentioned a few weeks ago, um, it's important to go back and read Joe Cruz's book. Joe Cruz is the one who founded uh, Amazing Facts, and he writes this book called, he wrote this book called Creeping Compromise. Creeping Compromise is pivotal. It's important also to get back into your, your, your uh, great controversy book and go back and read chapters or whatnot and see how compromise is going to be, has been coming into the church. Additionally, it's imperative to know something that Ellen White wrote about, which is called the Alpha and the Omega of Apostasy, where she talks about the Alpha or the beginning of the apostasy started when John Hyper. Harvey Kellogg wrote this book called The Living Temple, where it, where it had a lot of pantheism in it or whatnot. But it was so much, it was so much truth with era mix that so many people were deceived. And that caused a ripple effect in the early 1900s within the Seventh day Adventist Church. And so there's, there's trust, trust and believe there's been a lot of compromise that has crept in slowly but surely. But when you go back to great controversy, you see that that happened in the early churches as well, slowly but surely, because the devil recognized, hey, being uh, outright with certain things is not working to stop these Christians. So let me creep in with some compromise or whatever. So that is, the doctrine of compromise is very, very um, damaging to a church, right? So that's Jesus' appraisal. Now, a few phrases that we're going to cover um, from from these verses is the phrase, the woman Jezebel, I will kill her children, the one who searches kidneys and heart, uh, who have not known the deep things of Satan, Jesus counsel to the church, the promise, the promise to the overcomer, and the call to hear the spirit. All right, so the woman Jezebel, let me move something on my screen because it's blocking a few of my words. All right, here we go. Jezebel may be the symbolic name of a prominent woman in the church of Thyatira, who claimed to have the prophetic gift and exercise great authority, which she claimed to have received from God. So let me stop right there. Jezebel, while it is alluding to the Old Testament, I'm going to share that in a second. It, there may have been a literal Jezebel as well within that church. He's named Jezebel after the wife of the Old Testament king, remember Ahab, who corrupted the faith in Israel by introducing the idolatrous worship of Baal and Astarte, 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 31 and 33. Whoever she might be, Jezebel and Thyatira had a persuasive influence in the church. The permissive teaching of compromise was the same as that of the Nicolaitans, we read about that, and the Balaamites, we read about that, in Ephesus and Pergamum, who did much harm to the local congregations in the province of Asia. She could have been a leader of the Galatians in the church in Thyatira. Most of those in the church were evidently seduced by the prophetess to compromise and to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. She was wrecking havoc right there within the church, continuing with this particular person. Prophetess openly taught and promoted compromise with the world standards, and she did it with great success. For most of the congregation followed her seductive teaching. Remember, she was right there within the church, right there in the church of Thyatira. Only a minority, minority who are referred to as the remaining ones had not succumbed to her persuasive influence and remained faithful to the gospel preached by John. While the church in Ephesus lacked ardent love, and focused only on the obedience to God, thus becoming legalistic and severe in dealing with and checking those who are not doctrinally sound, the church in Thyatira went to the other extreme. Neither one of those extremes are good, but this church Thyatira goes to the other side of the extreme. In emphasizing love and the gospel, this church tolerated the false teaching that preferred sound doctrine and conduct doing much harm to the purity of the gospel teaching and church unity. It can't be stressed enough that what has happened in the past will happen again and has happened again. As Solomon says, there's no new thing under the sun. Not a single thing new is under the sun. And so compromise constantly creeps into the church and it's not always going to be from who you may think it is, right? The devil is cunning. We always have to remember that, right? And if you read uh, uh, the Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White talks about in the last days how different things will come into the church to stir us back 
the truth, to stir us back to reading, to stir us back to uh, uh, some of our beginning principles or whatnot. And so it is imperative that we know truth, stand on truth, share truth, get rooted and grounded in this truth. Things that you may need to refresh your mind on, it is imperative to do that because there are some things that are coming on this work in this coming with coming to the church in this world that are going to happen soon and very soon and everything that can be shaken will be shaken many will be shaken out of the church unfortunately and many from out in the world will take the places of the church and why it says that so it is imperative we get into the bible it's imperative we get into the writings of Ellen White. It's imperative that we don't compromise our faith. It is imperative that we understand scripture. All right. Um, so Christ was not pleased with the compromising attitude of this woman and her followers. So he took some decisive steps. Obviously, Christ is not going to be pleased with the compromising spirit of, of something coming into the church. So this is what he did. First, he gave her time that she might repent. Second, he symbolically threatened to kill her children with the plague. The execution of judgment on this compromising group served as a warning with redemptive pur purposes to others by stating, and all the churches, excuse me, will know that I am the one who searches the kidneys and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. And that's one of the things about when we're sharing truth with, with individuals um, or individuals are doing something that they shouldn't, you know, you want to you want to give the message in a way that um, invites them to repentance, right? Um, and that's what Christ did. He first gave her time to repent, right? We want to do that exact same things. Yes, some people have gone astray, but it's imperative that we present the invitation to repent, Turn from your wicked ways, turn ye, turn ye, as the Bible says, why will you perish? Now, there's that phrase um, in, in there which says, I will kill, I will kill her children. Uh, and this is an allusion to King, King Ahab's 70 children who were slaughtered by Jehu. If you need more information on that, that's in the screen on the screen, 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. So that's what that phrase points back to symbolically. Um, now we see in there the one who searches kidneys and hearts. Now, this statement is drawn from Jeremiah 17, 10. Again, the revelation comes from the Old Testament. So many things that you may not understand. If you go back to the Old Testament, it, it, it is the key to understanding a lot of what's transpiring in the book of Revelation. So this statement of uh, the, uh, the searching of the kidneys and the hearts, it comes from Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 10. Um, and that, that word kidneys is often translated as mind. That's why some versions say mind and heart. Some versions say kidney and heart, right? And so um, let me start at the beginning again. This statement is drawn from Jeremiah 17, 10, where the search kidneys, often translated as minds and hearts, belongs only to God. That's what he does, not us. In the ancient world, kidneys were regarded as the seat of emotions and the heart as the seat of intelligence of the will. And it is God who searches these very depths within us. Now, we also have the phrase, who have not known the deep things of Satan. This refers to the misleading teaching of the Nicolaitans. And don't worry, we, as you know, we're going to do a review of all of the churches. So to refresh your memory of the Nicolaitans, the Balaamites. Um, and, and Jezebel, you know, when we get past it. Um, and so this refers to the misleading teaching of the Nicolaitans, which can be briefly described like this. Christian who has knowledge of the deep things of Satan, in parentheses, who has experienced sin in its fullness, is able to enjoy the full freedom of Christ in Christ and can have a real appreciation of grace. Those who remained at the elementary instruction of the, of the apostles who feared to join in the activities of the trade guilds and kept themselves apart from the world should be looked upon with pity, right? And so those who have not known the deep things of Satan, very, very important um, phrase. And again, when I give the review, we'll go further into a few things also. Um, Jesus counseled now to the church. Jesus called those who remain faithful in Thyatira the remaining ones. This phrase is used in the book of Revelation in a special sense with reference to God's faithful end time people. Those remaining ones are those who have not known the deep things of Satan. I don't know about you. Yes, I've done some crazy things, but I ain't trying to go deep, 
deep, deep, deep into them things of Satan because that gets real hairy and hectic within those. So Jesus had given his counsel to the church uh, for those who are the remaining ones that have not fallen so deep into Satan. Now we come to the promise, right? The promise is that Jesus promises that he will not lay on them any burden except hold what they have until he comes. Any Another burden, I'm sorry, I meant to say another burden. Another burden refers to the instruction given by the apostles at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, 28 and 29. If you're not familiar with Acts chapter 15, um, you have a lot of the debate in there about uh, circumcision. And so I would encourage you to go back to Acts chapter 15 and matter of fact go back to the whole acts and refresh yourself with that um the promise to the overcomer now those those who sorry let me move something down on my screen those who remain loyal to christ are given a twofold promise there's the overcomer to the overcomer they will be given the authority of the nations remember jesus has all authority but was shared with the overcomer in the new earth in the earth made new jesus is willing to share that authority. He says, I have all, all authority. All authority has been given unto me, right? He's willing to share it. The second thing is, I will give him the morning star. Jesus is the morning star, according to Revelation 22, 16, where he calls himself the bright and the morning star. Therefore, the second promise is that they will receive Christ himself. I don't know about you, but I want that authority, and I want Christ in his fullness dwelling within me. Hence, this twofold promise means that the overcomers will not only be with Christ and rule with him, but they will have a special and close relationship with him. They will never lose him and will be forever with him. I don't know about you, but, you know, we going through this whole Christian walk and experience and the ups and downs of life. I believe we all want to be in that close relationship with him and, and um, we will have to endure certain things in order to experience some of what the word of God is speaking about, to have an eternal life with Jesus Christ. So now we move, hold on, my thing is frozen just a smidgen. There we go. We move to the phrase where it said, call to hear the spirit. The experience of a minority of the believers in the church of Thyatira proves that love and faith manifested in Christian service and perseverance can be experienced even in the churches where the majority have chosen to follow a way of compromise to the world standards and conform to a non-Christian lifestyle. Christian service and perseverance are the result of the working and transforming influence of the Holy Spirit upon the heart, inner work. They are not conditioned by favorable circumstances. What that is saying is even when the circumstances are bad, even when there's death, disease, and every other thing that is coming upon this world, no matter what it is, these individuals say, I am going to stand firm. I will not yield. I will not compromise, no matter what happens within the church. And Ellen White says, it may, the church may look like it's about to fall, but it goes through. Do, do not jump ship at all. Now I want to leave you with a few possible personal applications and a few of those possible personal applications is one, Christ knows you better than you know yourself. He searches deep, deep within every single last one of us, right? Second thing is do not yield to compromise because it gives place to the devil. I know it is very easy and that's why Joe Cruz's book is entitled Creeping compromise because it slowly comes upon right creeping compromise and the last person possible personal application is to continue to overcome anything that comes your way heaven is for the overcomer you've overcome the compromise you've overcome everything that has come your way you've overcome you stood firm Yes, you've fallen a few times, but you got back up. And that's the thing about an overcomer is you're constantly overcoming no matter how many times you fall. And so whatever compromise you see coming in your church, yes, be willing to speak up against it. But at the same time, stand firm no matter what, though the heavens fall, because there's a place in the kingdom of God for you as you stand firm in the faith. In Jesus Christ, let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that we can be overcomers through you. 
We thank you, Lord, that you can fill us, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, that you give us that wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, Lord, to see things, to see things coming into the church, to speak out of, against them in love, Heavenly Father, that we might even win the individual over who may be presenting false truth, false doctrine, as well as compromise. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be witnesses and lights in a dark world and stand firm no matter what comes our way. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. 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 Bless you. Amen.